All right, I'm so glad you're joining me. I'm going to be reading The Door in the Wall by Marguerite de Angeli. Uh, it is a yearly Newberry book. Chapter 1 Robin drew the coverlet close about his head and turned his face to the wall. He covered his ears and shut his eyes, for the sound of the bells was deafening. All the bells of London were ringing the hour of knowns. St. Mary Le Beau was nearest. St. Swithin's was close by, and not far away stood great St. Paul's. There were half a dozen others within sound, each clamoring to be heard. It seemed to Robin as if they were all inside his head, screaming to be let out. Tears of vexation started to his eyes, but he held them back, for he remembered that a brave and genteel knight does not cry. Ever since he could remember, Robin had been told what was expected of him as son of his father. Like other sons of noble family, he would be sent away from his mother and father to live in the household of another knight, where he would learn the ways of knighthood. He would learn how to be of service to his liege lord, how to be courteous and gentle, and at the same time strong of heart. Robin thought of his father and how he had looked on that last day when he rode off to the Scottish Wars at the head of the column. Now, remembering, Robin could almost feel the weight of his father's mailed glove on his shoulder as he said goodbye. Then he had been straight and strong, standing there in the courtyard as the men rode forth. Farewell, my son, his father had said. Forget not to be brave. God knows when we shall meet again. Farewell. He must not cry. Robin thought of his mother and how she too had said farewell the day after his 10th birthday. She had called him to her side in the solar where she sat weaving. Since his father left for the wars, it has been a comfort to have her near. She said, but you are 10 and no longer a child to be looked after by women folk. It is time now for you to leave me. John the Fletcher will come for you in a few days and will take you to Sir Peter de Lindsay as we have arranged. There too, you will be away from danger of the plague, which seems to be spreading. And now it is fitting that I obey the wish of the queen to be her lady in waiting, for she is in need of my care. Today an escort will be sent for me and I shall go. John the cook, Gregory and Dame Ellen will serve you until John the Fletcher arrives. Farewell, my son, be brave. She had drawn Robin to her and had turned away so he would not see her tears. Little did she know how much Robin would need her. For the very next day, he had become sick, I'm sorry, ill, and unable to move his legs. That had been more than a month ago. He was cold. He wished Ellen would come to mend the fire. The bells stopped ringing, and Robin heard the boys from the brothers' school running and shouting along the street. He hoped that William or John, Thomas or Roger, would come in to tell him the news. But when their voices grew faint, he knew they had gone on past. How he wished he were with them. Even the tiresome lessons of singing and reading would be worth doing if only he could run down the street with the other boys. But he could not run. He couldn't even get out of bed. 
because he was unable to see out the wind hole, which is the window, Robin had learned to guess at what was going on down the street. He knew the sound of armor and knightly equipment, for the king's men passed that way going to and from the Tower of Westminster, to joust or tournament, to parade or on business for the king. A horse was passing now, but Robin was sure it was not of that order. It was probably the Shire Reeves horse. For above the slow clatter over the cobbles, Robin could hear the grating of runners on a kind of sled the horse was dragging. From the odor that came through the window, he could guess that what hoaxster had been taken again for selling putrid fish in the market stall. <laughs> Robin chuckled. He knew that soon war would be standing in the stocks. I'm sorry, what would be standing in the stocks near the fish market with his evil smelling goods hanging from his neck. Now Robin heard the sound of Dame Ellen's feet shuffling along the passage to his wall chamber. He turned his head to see what kind of dish she carried, but quickly looked away when he saw that it was a bowl of steam rising from it. Was it barley soup? Was it a stew of rabbit? He didn't know and didn't care. The thought of it was all mixed with the sickening odor that came up with the raw wind from the street. Ellen's skirt brushed the bed as she leaned toward Robin. She was near enough so he could hear the creak of her starched linen cough as she peered at him to see whether he was asleep. He shut his eyes so as not to see the great whiskered wart on her chin and tried to close his ears to the sound of her cockney speech. She saw by the squinching of his eyes that he was awake. <laughs> Turn away, do. There's a good lad, she said, intending her voice to be soft, but it was not. It sounded harsh and flat, as if her mouth had been stretched too wide, thought Robin. He shook his head and closed his mouth tight against the food. Wilt not have this good pottage all with honey spread? Ellen's coaxing voice went on. Robin shuddered and buried his face in, his cush in the cushion. If only his lady mother were here, she would have seen to it that the porridge had been smoothly cooked and salted. She would speak in her gentle way with the pleasant mixture of Norman French and good English words that were becoming the fashion. If only she were here, all would be well. The damp, sweaty feeling would leave his head. His legs would obey him and take him where he wanted to go, racing up and down alleyways or along the high street. He would be running with the boys down Pudding Lane or across London Bridge, playing tag among the ships, shops. <laughs> but his legs would not obey him. They were like two long pieces of uncooked dough, he thought, such as John the cook rolled out on his molding board. Ellen turned gently at the coverlet. Sweet lad, she begged, twill give thee strength and mend those ailing limbs. Robin would neither turn nor answer. Let her take the sickening stuff away. Let her throw it into the street on top of that fishmonger who had just gone past. Come, my pretty. But Ellen got no further with her wheedling. Robin gathered all his strength and flung his arm 
toward the bowl of porridge, sending it flying out of Ellen's hands and spreading its contents all over her. He was ashamed as soon as he had done it, but Ellen did look funny with the mess hanging from her chin. <laughs> Wicked boy, she cried. No more will I serve thee. Scarce able to stand have I been this day, yet have I been faithful. But I am a free woman and can go my way. Just wait and see when, when more victuals are brought thee, ungrateful wretch. She burst into loud weeping and left the room, wiping the porridge off of her apron. Robin turned again to the wall. She will come back, he thought, as she has done before. And she had better bring something I like if she wants me to eat it. But she didn't come back. An hour went by, then another hour. It grew colder and colder. Robin examined for the hundredth time the carvings on the hammer beams supporting the roof of the hall. Each one was an angel with feathered wings. He studied one by one the grotesque carvings of dwarves that decorated the roof bosses and the corbels finishing the doorway. He wearied of thinking about them and wished that Ellen would come back. Robin's bedchamber was off the main hall or living room of the house in an embrasure of the thick wall. Like the hall, Robin's room was somewhat chapel-like for the houses of that time of Edward the Third of England were very little different from churches. <laughs> Afternoon sounds came into the room, people passing along the street to and from the shops in Cheapside or Poultry Lane. Carters carrying goods to the wharves on the Thames, Bellin's Gate or Queen Hythe. He heard children playing games, hoodmen blind and hide and seek. He wished he could have, he could have been among them because he knew a secret nook where he always hid and where he was seldom discovered. It was down a honey lane in the angle of a jutting wall near Black Friars Entry. It was so small a space that it appeared to be no space at all. It was still his own secret. Robin tried very hard to get out of bed so he might look out of the window, but he only fell back again onto the pillow, exhausted from the effort. Hungry bit at his empty stomach. He was hungry enough now to have eaten the porridge Ellen had brought him. He listened, hoping to hear the footsteps of the passage. But the house was strangely silent. No sound of talk or laughter came from the hall, for most of the servants and retainers had gone either with his father, Sir John de Berford, or with his mother, the Lady Maud. Robin looked for Ellen, and when he had no answer, Robin called for Ellen, and when he had no answer, called for John the cook, then for old Gregory the gardener. He listened again, holding his breath, but he heard no one, and saw not a soul from nones to vespers, when the bells began to ring again. He was alone. Just as the bells stopped ringing, Robin heard a noise as of a door opening. Then someone mounted the stair and came along the passage. Perhaps it was one of the boys, but not likely, for whoever it was walked rather slowly instead of running as William or Thomas 
or John would have done. The footsteps turned toward the chamber. In the doorway stood a monk with a basket. He came toward the bed where Robin lay. Good eve, my son, he said. I am Brother Luke, a wandering friar, newly come to St. Mark's. I have brought thee food and cause, tis Friday, fish. <laughs> fish! Robin's stomach took a sudden turn, but a good smell came from the covered basket Brother Luke carried, and he was hungry, so he smelled a welcome, and the friar explained how he had happened to know that Robin needed help. A poor widow who twice a week is fed from our hospice told me of thy need. She said that Dame Ellen, who lately served thee, had this very day, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> gosh, let me go back. She said that Dame Ellen, who lately served thee, had, has this very day been taken of the plague. She, she, it was told of us that all thy servants too are fled because of the plague and some are dead of it. Dame Ellen told thee not, pitying thee. Now, be a good lad and take thy supper. He obediently ate what the friar fed him. When he was fed, Brother Luke, who had talked quietly the while, fetched water in a basin, washed him, and in other ways made him comfortable. He took the rumpled sheets off the bed, then sat down to rub Robin's legs and back. While he rubbed, he spoke. It is well known that thy noble father hath of his goodness given money to St. Mark's. So to St. Mark's I'll take thee and will care for thee in mine own quarters because all other beds and places are already taken by those in the parish who have great need. Even the corridors are filled with the cloisters lined with pallets. But I cannot walk, Robin said woefully. See you, my two legs are as useless as if they were logs of wood. How shall I go there? My father is with the king at the Scottish Wars, and with him are all his men at arms. My lady mother has been commanded to attend upon her majesty the queen. It is supposed by them that I am now page in the household of Sir Peter de Lindsay at his castle in the north. John the Fletcher was to have come to me, come for me in March before the feast of St. Gregory. Instead, a messenger came on that day to say that he had been set upon by thieves and lay wounded in the hospice at Reading. He came later to fetch me, but found me thus, unable to walk or ride. He brought a surgeon who said, I had not the plague, but some other malady. He told Ellen to feed me well, and that he would return. He came not again, nor did John the Fletcher. Alas, said Brother Luke, sadly, because of the plague, all the physicians are working day and night. Either, his, either he himself has been taken or he has been so busy caring for others, he has not been able to return. As for John the Fletcher, he may have gone out the city gate and not been allowed to re-enter, for they're keeping strangers out now. Fear not for the manner of our going to St. Mark's. Tethered in the courtyard, is a Jeanette ready, saddled with blankets, 
whereon thou ride softly. Walking beside thee, I shall support thee. And so we shall go through Knight Rider Street and Giltspur to Ludgate and then towards Smoothfield where stands St. Mark's. Dost remember the long wall that is about the garden of thy father's house? Yes, said Robin, of course. Why? Dost remember too the wall about the tower or any other wall? Robin nodded. Have they not all a door somewhere? Yes, said Robin again. Always remember that, said the friar. Thou hast only to follow the wall far enough, and there will be a door in it. I will remember, Robin promised, but he wasn't sure that he knew what Brother Luke meant to say. Remember, he was speaking. The f While he was speaking, the friar had been caring for Robin, easing his tired muscles and making him clean and comfortable. He opened a large chest and found under linen and hosen, a hood with a long peak and a warm cloak. The evening damp creeps up from these, from the Thames, said the friar, pulling the hosen over Robin's shrunken legs. And thou, and though the days are longer now, it is still early in the season. Good English wool will keep thee warm. Now for the hood. He pulled the hood down over Robin's head and settled it around his shoulders while he held him against his coarse woven monk's frock. Then Brother Luke put his strong arms under Robin, hoisted him onto his back, carrying the bundle of Robin's clothes and the basket in one hand and steadying Robin with the other. Down they went through the great echoing hall down the winding stair at the other end past the empty kitchens and out onto the courtyard. There stood the little Spanish horse, Jenny, just as Brother Luke had said, patiently waiting. Brother Luke set Robin on the jennet, on the, jennet the robe and blankets around him, making him comfortable. Brother Luke put a strap around Robin's waist, then ran it under Jeanette's belly to keep him from falling. He tied the bundle on at the back and they set forth. Out through the door in, in the wall of the courtyard, they went into the street, Robin leaning against Brother Luke and the Jeanette picking her way sedately, sedately over the cobbles. <laughs> there were not many abroad, for it was the end of the day. Curfew was ringing as they turned up Creed Lane and Ludgate Hill. And only because the guard knew Brother Luke's habit were they allowed to pass through the city gate. By then, they were more than halfway to the hospice, but it was nearly dark when they reached St. Mark's and were admitted by the porter at the postern gate. Will I go back home soon? asked Robin fearfully, for the gate had changed, had clanged shut behind them as if it had been closed forever. Will a message be sent to my father or to my mother? Be comfortable, my child, Brother Luke answered. As soon as the plague is somewhat quieted in London, a message will be sent to thy father. Meanwhile, we shall care for thee. He lifted Robin and carried him to his own cell and put him on the narrow cot. Now rest, my son, he said. That is the end of chapter one.